Hello, thank you for coming. My name is Leslie Bartlebaugh and I work in the Urban Design Center upstairs as part of the planning department for the city of Raleigh. And uh, thank you for coming to our UDC Talks today. Uh, this is part of a larger lecture series that's been happening all summer since, I guess, May. And this series this year, we've been doing the UDC Talks for some years now, but uh, I know a lot of you are familiar, but for those who aren't, um, this year, the series, we, uh, the staff from the Urban Design Center partnered with the Dix Park uh, staff team. So everybody that worked on this series this year, raise your hand. It's a nice team of people. So uh, thanks, you guys, and thanks, everybody, for making this happen. Uh, let's see. I want to thank uh, everybody for coming, and I want to thank our speaker, Gigo Di Tommaso. It's going to be a really great lecture today. It's going to get you excited. So. And I also want to thank the Dix Park Conservancy for helping sponsor the series and making all of this happen. And we've had a few nighttime talks, uh, a lot of daytime talks. This is about, I guess, um, eighth talk this year. We have tentatively three more. There's a few scheduling things we're trying to work out for the last few talks, so stay tuned. But you can always check it out on the Urban Design Center por portion of the City of Raleigh website to stay up to date. And once we finalize the, the end of the schedule, we'll reprint these posters and get those out there for you to see. So with that, I'm going to introduce Caroline Lindquist, my colleague in the Dix Park planning team. And she's going to introduce Gigo. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Gigo. Gigo is an Italian architect, urbanist, and educator. He has been focusing his research and practice on public space design for more than a decade. Trained at the Florence School of Architecture, Gigo began his professional trajectory in Barcelona, where he lived and worked for several years before relocating to San Francisco to join the Rebar Art and Design Studio. As a member of Rebar, Gigo spearheaded some of the group's most ambitious projects from conception to, through implementation. In 2013, he began teaching at the University of California, Berkeley College of Environmental Design and in 2014 contributed to starting Gale Studio, the American office of the Danish Urban Design Consultancy, founded by Jan Gale. In this lecture, Gigo will describe his approach to urban design through the lenses of the projects that have seen him active in Europe and across the Americas, specifically focused on his projects with Rebar and Gale Studios. Please welcome Gigo Di Tommaso. Hi everybody, thank you for having me today. I want to start uh, by telling the story of this small uh, collective of artists and designers called Rebar, a collective from San Francisco. Um, I was lucky enough to be uh, working with them since the very moment they moved from, from Europe to the US. More than 10 years ago, Rebar started with um, a very um, simple experiment in public space. We selected a parking spot in downtown San Francisco and we paid regularly um, feeding the parking meters, but instead than parking our car, we just unrolled some grass, we put a tree in a tree box, we put a nice old school cast iron bench, um, a little fence around it, and we just started to observe what, uh, what could happen. It was very nice to see that you know, it was at lunchtime and in a weekday, just a few minutes after uh, people started to use this little space, as you would imagine, sitting on the bench, um, trying to find some shade under the tree. And after a little while, they even started to interact, to talk to each other. Well, this simple experiment became a blog post. That was 2005, so it was the very beginning of you know, uh, the, blog, um, the blog era. And really, really, uh, the post had a lot of traction. A lot of people found this amusing, interesting, uh, fascinating in many ways. And why is that? Um, that is because if we think of it, 80% of our public space is actually made of streets. And most of our streets are roadway, and they're really, even in urban context, very much designed around the need of the automobile. Well, the experiment was so successful that um, a few months after, we decided to make a festivity out of it. We called it Parking Day. We created a manual that was um, down, something you could download online, where we uh, would explain how you could celebrate your own parking day in your own city. We decided on a date. 
um, we explain all the details on how you could do your little park installation in uh, parking spots. The rules of the games were clear. You had to feed the parking meter. Uh, there was nothing in the, in the game that had to be, you know, unlegal. After all, when you pay for a parking with your parking meter coins, uh, you're actually leasing that space. And it's not asked for you to park your car. You can really do whatever you want with it. People kind of like the idea. This is one of the first years in San Francisco. We also explained to participants to this initiative that they had to be um, as kind, as gentle um, with whoever had something to say about it. So for example, explaining uh, to whoever wants to give you a parking ticket that you actually are obeying the law by um, using this grass and, uh, uh, for, for a different use. Um, very quickly, more and more people were doing that every year, right? Um, actually, we just celebrated Parking Day uh, for the 11th time this year, just a couple of weeks ago. They started to do it in other parts of California, um, that was Sacramento, other cities across America. Growing and growing in size, having more and more little parks every year. This is not even a parking spot anymore, it's an entire street. And then the thing started to be you know, exported. People across the world were just connecting to the site, downloading the manual, and during their parking day in their own city. This year in Dublin, this is a photo from Mexico City. This is Seoul, Korea. Uh, this is a map from, I want to say, maybe five or six years ago that was mapping the park, parking day installations um, of that year. I think that actually parking day came uh, to North Carolina too. I recognize someone in the photo here. Parking day become, became also a great opportunity for school of architecture to experiment with small installations, uh, some more arty, some more uh, utilitarian, that were prototyping different uses of public space in a temporary manner or became a great opportunity to express a very simple idea um, about, you know, um, through metaphors or symbols about how we could use better uh, that very precious piece of real estate that the parking spot is. What Parking Day became, in many ways, in these 11 years, a catalog of urban prototyping ideas. An open source system that allows you to uh, look at what other people have done and maybe uh, repeat it or uh, use it as an inspiration for a more permanent um, way of transforming the right of way. Parking Day um, at some point caught the attention of the mayor of San Francisco, Gary Newsom, and he asked Rebar to start a more legit, if you will, um, collaboration starting from the idea of Parking Day. How can we use the idea of Parking Day to inspire, to inform? some more permanent transformation to the public realm. Well, the idea was uh, then to create something called a parklet, a modular um, system that could be installed in parking sp spaces in front of um, businesses or even private residences. The idea was that um, maybe the business owner can pay for it while the, the city is giving the permit to use that space. That was the, re the invention of the parklet that now has become a thing of itself. These are one of the first parklets in San Francisco. In the beginning, Rebar was um, thinking that, you know, um, our practice would be about designing a lot of parklets. It didn't end up really being like that. The idea took off way beyond our possibility um, to really design each of them. There are now 100 parklets in San Francisco. Not, of, not all of them are modular like this. They're just different kind of installation. We help also the city, the planning department, to establish a very specific new kind of permit called the parklet program and the parklet permit. We even help the city mapping out all the process is necessary from going um, from the idea of wanting to expand the public domain in front of your business to actually having an implemented parklet. And now parklet programs are starting all across the country and actually are starting all across the world. There is a, a parking, uh, parklet program in Sao Paulo, Brazil, one again in Mexico City, in many cities across the world, especially cities that have um, very tight spaces um, where 
you know, the space for people is rather reduced, or in spaces that, uh, that maybe have a lot of uh, grand streets, but where streets are rather devoted to the use of the automobile. After, after working on parking and uh, parking day and parklets, with Rebar we continued to work uh, on public space installations trying really to uh, see in which way through scrappy, quick intervention we could make uh, the public realm of our city and other cities better. One of the fundamental ideas behind this was really broadening the spectrum of people using uh, public space. The more diverse, the better, the more successful public space would be. Uh, we work on this idea of making public space comfortable, uh, we had a, lo a lot of analogies and, and, and metaphors of bringing furniture from uh, just like you would have in your living room into the street and see what happened. This idea of softening the public realm that is you know, dominated by the gray concrete. Um, this was one, uh, one experiment with inflatable furniture. Coloring the public realm, we'd like to work a lot with um, actually residents. In this case, in Washington DC, um, we asked these kids to draw um, furniture in the form of animals, uh, and then we went back to San Francisco, uh, designed with the CNC um, system uh, uh, um, modules of uh, uh, flat pack furniture. We went back to uh, DC and asked the kids to color the pieces uh, before putting them in use. Many of our projects also work with light. We, um, we were inspired by those cities that leave uh, their nights as much as they leave their days, and we were trying every time that we could to bring light to um, the street environment, especially in places that had a poor perception of safety. And we were working a lot on this idea of making um, public space and public space installation reconfigurable. Um, we like the idea that people could actually adapt them, move them um, in the way they wanted in order to establish, foster a, a better sense of ownership of what is in the public realm. Many of our projects were insisting on this idea of greening or bringing vegetation back to the public realm. And we also had a couple of projects that work on the idea of uh, connecting with food production and food culture. This is called Victory Garden, a massive installation in the City Hall of San Francisco uh, in collaboration with uh, Alice Water from the restaurant Chez Panisse in Berkeley. Uh, we grew uh, in the main square of, of San Francisco food that then was donated um, to the homeless community of the city. As a designer uh, training in Florence, I really had a hard time actually in the beginning understanding that Public space design is not necessarily about something beautiful, something durable, something well-crafted. Um, I, I was really struggling with the scrappy uh, identity of some of our projects, but more and more, um, year after year, I was kind of getting it. In many cases, you don't need something, um, you know, uh, very permanent to, to have a big impact. Some of our projects were actually just events, throwing events in places that were struggling for specific problems in public spaces and let the activation really do the thing. Going against the, the common ideas that public space is kind of a boring space, trying to bring that whimsical, surprising element to it. This is a, a band shell built with 200 um, car hoods, again, in San Francisco. Well, making public space extraordinary was our mission. We worked as hard as we could to achieve it. Um, at some point, though, we realized that something was still missing in the picture. That we were ready to uh, give another leap. Mm, in spite of all the recognition that Rebar as a collective has had. And this is where the story of Rebar connected with the story of uh, another uh, group of people, in particular, with uh, the story of this gentleman with the umbrella, uh, Jan Gell, Danish architect. Uh, the study architecture back in Europe around the 1960s. In the years in which modern movement was at the height of its um, uh, success in terms of transforming urban environment across the world, 
uh, the so-called international style, where in the School of Architecture, including in the US School of Architecture, plans like this were drawn and people would say, oh yes, that looks great. This is really how the city should look like. And that was already uh, impacting uh, the built environment in a, in a very strong manner, um, going toward the idea that the city was uh, or had to be a perfectly efficient machine. Uh, everything was really about uh, order and efficiency. Young was particularly uh, affected, uh, we think, by um, the impact that modern movement or a certain application of the canons of the modern movement had in uh, Scandinavia and especially in the uh, housing, um, housing industry. Uh, especially the public space, the space between the building was incredibly desolate and very different from the traditional way of conceiving public space in Scandinavian cities. The wife um, of Jan was a psychologist, is a psychologist, Ingrid Gell, and she was giving him particularly a hard time as a young architect, saying, why don't architects really worry about people? Everything seems to be about the building, about the efficiency of the system, about uh, you know, the, the rapid infrastructure and um, order, but what about the people? From these conversations, the, um, the two decided to actually embark into a journey and a large research. They got a, a grant from, from the Danish government, and for two years they traveled across Europe, most specifically and especially across Italy, making an investigation on the relationship between the use of public space and the urban form. Uh, I found this very nice Italian, uh, Italian article from the era. This reads something like, it looks like a hipster, but it's not. Um, this, is, uh, this is Jan um, taking notes, sitting on the steps of an Italian church, and doing what has been done uh, and doing for, for a long time, trying to understand, when it comes to public spaces, where are the places where people stop or, or don't stop? Where they linger or they don't linger? How do they walk? How do they, they traverse spaces? What is making uh, spaces more attractive than others, more interesting than others? What can really foster a solid um, public life? All of these notes, all of these diagrams, all of this conversation with his wife became two books. One book in environmental psychology by, by Ingrid Gell and one book about architecture, or more specifically, I shall say, the life between buildings, the life between architecture. It was the 1970s, the book became a big uh, success, if you will, and was translated in many, many different languages. Well, what is, what is the book going after, really? It's trying to focus on the relevance of the human dimension in urban habitats. After all, uh, we know this very well, all cultures are different and climate are different. These are the crazy Danes on a typical winter uh, weekday going to work on a bike. Um, but after all, there are certain things that we all do in the same manner. In a hot day, we're all looking for shade. Uh, in, a, in a cold day, we are all looking for a place where we can have our shoulders protected, um, maybe facing uh, south or facing the sun. We are all looking for places to linger if we are given any. Uh, I have a catalog of these photos taken across the words of people sitting on things that are not designed to be seated on, like these ballers, right? People like to sit in public space if the weather is nice, the company is nice, if they have a place to sit. And people actually in, like to enjoy a nice walk if we design for that to really be possible. People actually um, can establish incredibly meaningful connection in public space if given the opportunity. And public space is not just about you know, uh, compression, density, many people in the same place. Public space in urban context, as uh, in this room you know very well, as you're working on Dix Park, is also about finding um, respite, finding places for contemplation, for connection with nature. Finding uh, in natural or very urban setting, 
um, occasion for these whimsical, surprising, exciting moments in life. When it, when it comes to the science of it, how does that translate into the making of um, the urban fabric and, uh, and the urban space? Well, because the research of Jan starts as an intersection between uh, urban design, urban planning, and, and psychology, uh, the first book contains a lot, of, um, a lot of content that is really looking at how the brain works when it comes to relating with urban space. Our brain requires a very high number of stimuli uh, constantly, actually one every four seconds to really get what it wants. And Jan is particularly good at explaining in his book how modern movement um, and let's just say the architecture of most of the 20th century that is really shaping the cities in the way they're still today is really not able to provide the stimuli. It's redesigned going after other principles, other canons, other uh, goals. This is a very famous building in, in Copenhagen. I remember studying this building uh, back in, in Florida in the, architect in the architectural school for the architectural buffs in the rooms. This is the Danish bank by Jan, uh, I'm sorry, by Arne Jacobsen. One of the most expensive facades um, I, I, I learned in, in the history of, of Danish architecture, this is all uh, travertine marble imported directly from the quarrels of Rome. The building is very famous because it's made by this uh, very famous architect. But actually, when it comes to what this building is doing for people walking in the street, this, this building is behaving exactly like a blank, um, you know, a blank wall that is getting a gated community or um, the wall of a big box retail. Uh, this, this building is absolutely failing to give people what people really want when they are experiencing urban space. People want stimuli, want connection with what's happening in the private spheres, what permeable facades, want stimuli every four seconds. And actually the experience of the city is incredibly sensorial and the design should go back to that, should go back to being able to, to stimulating senses. Most of what we capture when we um, experience urban spaces comes from the site and not just the site at 360 degrees, there is a very specific cone of site which actually corresponds to what happens uh, along a street in the ground floor. That part of the urban environment is absolutely fundamental. A lot happens on edges and edges at the eye level. Good urban design is going back to really understanding that and working closely uh, with other disciplines to really um, put a lot of stress on the quality of these edges. As much as what is important is the human scale, the distance between people as they move across space. It's not the same for a plaza to be uh, 100 yard or 200 yard wide. There is a radical difference in what, how the humans with very specific senses and dimension is able to recognize and not recognize the other people that are sharing that space and what that is making to the perception of um, our condition in that space. And so going back to the human scale, going back to a better understanding of how public uh, realm works is going back to really working these distances in a very accurate way. Understanding the good public space design has to offer the possibility for interaction at different distances with different cohort, different groups of different sizes, going from a larger, sp a larger space to very intimate spaces. All of the research contained in the first book and in the other studies become um, become the point of start for a larger endeavor, which is helping cities across the world to make studies of the quality of their own public spaces in order to inform public space design. The research continues in a series of books, much more recent, and uh, the research becomes also the opportunity to create a group of people that are working with Jan on this consultancy work in cities across the world. 
Rebar, three years ago, decided to embark uh, in, a, in a mission with GAL to joining forces and to continue to work together in order to um, combine the uh, activist um, attitude that Rebar had in the beginning with a more solid research base as an opportunity to go deeper and um, to provide stronger uh, impact through our projects. So now that little table of Dane's architects is, is a bigger table. We have three offices, one in Copenhagen, one in San Francisco, and one in New York. This is a photo that we took in San Francisco uh, a couple of years ago when the group was formed. We are still a fairly small firm if you compare it to the scale of many. Um, we are pretty nimble, just a group of 15, 20 people in each city. But from that we really have a far reach. We travel a lot and work in cities across the world. One, one uh, particular aspect of our work is that we mix uh, the approach of designers and social scientists. We are a group of designers and social scientists working together. In our group, there are anthropologists, there are sociologists, uh, as much as there are, of course, architects and planners. And we do now a pretty broad, um, pretty broad spectrum of services from quick uh, experiments, pilot projects, to large visioning processes in which we help uh, a mayor of a city, for example, trying to understand what are the policies to be pushed forward in order to improve the quality of the urban space. We worked in more than 250 cities across the world. Particularly myself, I've been working especially in the, two, in, in the Americas, in North America, uh, Central America and Latin America. I just came back from a beautiful trip in the city of Cochabamba, Bolivia. Was hoping for a direct flight, Cochabamba Raleigh, but I realized that there was no any. Um, but it's really, really an incredible experience to be able to work on the same problems in radically different uh, urban environments. The core of our practice is going back to what people need. Understanding that there is right now, at the moment, still in our urban environments, an incredible disconnect between what design is trying to ask people to do like pressing this button, and what actually people want to do or just do. We call um, these desire lines, you can find them everywhere, in every city across the world. You can find them in Bolivia, you can find them in North Carolina. These are um, traces that show what uh, users of public space would want to do if the space was designed correctly around them. Um, one other way to start the uh, urban design project, for example, improving the quality of an infrastructure, is by studying desire lines, by studying how people are moving across that in in intersection. We are particularly interested in jaywalking patterns, which we don't try to block or limit. Jaywalking patterns are actually expressing an unmet need. This is just a quick example of how we can go back to people when it comes to design. And still working on the intersection between the life of the city and the form of the city. Um, physical planning has been focusing on this way too much, right? So it's really necessary to go back to understanding life pattern in cities in order to understand how this can inform this. This, to us, is the result of what's, um, what's behind it, the life of, of urban spaces. It really comes down to the relationship between public space and public life. But what is public life? We define it very simple, in a very simple manner. We say what a collective group of people create when they live their life outside their homes, outside their workplaces, and outside their cars. Um, it seems like a small part of our life, but it's a fundamental one. It's one that we know actually and tap a series of other bigger, much more important things like this, like sustainability, connectedness, trust, resilience, civic engagement. Everything meets at the center in public life. That's what we believe. When it comes to a project, we like actually to start, as I was saying before, by understanding the life patterns of the place. This is our first step, really. 
From that, we are then ready to design public space, knowing that buildings can actually come last. This seems a very obvious thing, but if you think of it, physical planning usually does the opposite. The architects are very interested in starting from their buildings as objects, as artifacts. They are really, really, they get really, really excited on the shape and the form of this. And then public space design becomes, you know, design of what remains in between buildings. And eventually, it's just about observing what kind of life that space is informing. Well, we like to do things the opposite way. And this is how our approach could translate in a simple diagram. This is our mantra. We start by measuring public life, then testing with little experiments with that same scrappy activist spirit that um, Rebar had, right? Fast uh, pilot projects. And then after that we evaluate them, we are ready for a larger investment, for larger scale, longer term projects. Measure, test, refine. The point of start is of course listening. And that's what we do the very first in every place that we work. We have developed along years very good techniques, we think, in order to understand what people care for and using that as the point of start for our research. But then we go back to that ethos of um, researcher and we start to measure. We measure how public life works uh, through a series of different tools that go from very classic one like intercept interviews to some that are a little bit more sophisticated. And we do it at different scale. We try to understand what's going on in a street or in a plaza. Then we try to understand how that inform the urban fabric block by block. And then we look to how this is actually informing the big picture at the metropolitan or urban scale. One thing that Jan started to do and that we still do is actually counting people. Counting going in the street with clickers and see how many people are walking or not walking on a sidewalk, how many people are stopping in a plaza for how long, what kind of activities they engage in. This is important for a series of reasons. The first reason is that actually the only thing that was counted up until very recently in urban environments like the one we are in today was only the flow of cars, right? Uh, transportation department has always had very accurate data when it comes to how many cars on, how ma on different streets, how fast, uh, when there is a traffic jam, when there is not. And that really brought the focus about uh, some kind of problem, problem solving that was just about cars. What if we do the same thing with people? What if we start to count people and see that bring the data up? Making argument using that piece of information will probably lead to a more people-oriented design. And that's actually what we found out happens. If we start a conversation with the mayor about how the pedestrian flows change in their main street in different times of the day, in different seasons, then the mayor starts to really understand that maybe there, there are a series of problems there that we can solve and that can have very positive implications for the well-being of the city in general. So this is the old school way. Uh, we actually help a lot of cities across the world learning this methodology. These were photos taken in Montevideo, Uruguay, a beautiful city, uh, the southernmost part of the world. We work with 120 students from the School of Architecture, making a broad assessment of how their main street was performing, uh, counting everything from people, actually in this case, to buses and how many people on the buses as a way of starting a large project of redesign of that street. We said you cannot really start to redesign the street if you don't do this kind of work first. But then we like to engage with new technologies and we understand that there is an incredible untapped territory of data um, to be discovered in social networks. Uh, data is actually available for whoever is able to harness it. This is a study that we did on Instagram posts in San Jose, California. The area in red marks the areas where people are posting the most number, the, the highest number of photos. Um, and you know, that is rel relatively interesting, maybe not too interesting. But what is actually interesting is that through Instagram, we can also know where are all the people that are posting 
uh, from in an, an anonymous way, of course, we don't know uh, who is living where, but we know um, we have a series of information of where these where this, uh, re the residences of the people that are here uh, are. That means that this becomes an incredibly valuable information in understanding who is accessing to the center and who is not. Which are the communities that are actually not using the resources and the assets that the center uh, is there to provide to everybody. So we can go very deep in understanding demographics dynamics in urban space through this kind of analysis. And the most beautiful thing is that if you have good data, you can really craft very convincing stories. And that's what we do. That's the, I would say the most fascinating part of our work is you know, crunching all of this in order to get to this. How can we make the reality of a city uh, very simple, starting from accurate data, in a, and explain stories that, that, that are credible that are, and that they are capable to really uh, convince people, change mindset. This was a, a very, very uh, interesting example. Actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this project afterwards. This was our work on, in Times Square that, as uh, you may know, Gell contributed uh, to transform to a, a long uh, process that started with a study of flows of cars and people in, in, in Times Square in New York. The big story there was that pedestrians were representing 90% of the users of Times Square, but actually, only 10% of Times Square was dedicated to pedestrians. When it comes to cars, you had exactly the opposite split. Only 10% of the people that were moving across the plaza were motorists, but they were actually occupying 90% of, of the area. And actually, Times Square, you know, had never been a square before. It's always been a big intersection with streets coming from all places and, you know, taxi uh, zooming around. And so, through this data, we were able to craft a story that was saying, let's make Times Square really a square. Let's try to change those proportions. Let's return some of this space to who actually is using the plaza. The good thing of working in different contexts is that we are amassing a lot of interesting information from different parts of, of the world, and cities tend to have uh, public space um, elements that resemble each other. Uh, every city tends to have a main street or a main square of different sizes, of different characters, but there are a lot of things that um, are often in common. And so having data with respect to a certain place can help us solve a problem in a city that is uh, trying to go through uh, a similar process of transformation. That's why we are creating this uh, large database. We call it the uh, public life database or people data. In every city where we work, we capture all the information, all the data that we uh, uh, were able to collect. And that becomes our archive through which we do a lot of comparative analysis. This is how it looks like. And we're willing uh, often to open up this data to whoever is trying to solve a problem in their own cities if, if we're working together on that. All of this listening and all of this researching informs design, informs interventions. That they are somewhat, in some cases, similar to the ones that I showed through, um, that I showed through those images that were showing projects that Rebar did. But now they're often a little bit larger and uh, um, more aimed to very specific objects. In many cases, our work, especially in the United States, is to bring back the human scale in the urban environment, to go back to the human scale, starting from what we have, which is often an entire urban setting that has been designed around the specific need of the automobile, from turning radius to streets, to width of streets, street sections, um, size of sidewalks, everything has been designed around the need of the automobile. But we know now that what is good for our health, what is good for our life, are actually walkable cities, bikeable cities, denser cities, cities that have to offer public spaces that can connect us further, that can build our community further. And so a lot of our intervention really are about trying to make things that look like this a little bit more like things that look like that. 
working very, very um, intensely in this idea that I was t telling you about before, that distance matter, that every space is creating um, opportunities for interaction depending on how carefully we work on the scale of it. And again, unlike in many Latin American cities where, where I work, the, the big problem for us in, in US cities is that spaces are very big, maybe too big to really foster that vibrancy, that energy um, that is necessary to create a uh, um, high quality public space. We are actually, uh, we cherish the small scale. We know that small means eventful, means intense, means warm. And this is the kind of energy that we are trying to bring back to the urban environment. So in a way, you may say that we are trying to work towards cities for people, starting from a context that is uh, the context of cities made for cars. How do we do it? We deploy a suite of quick uh, interventions of many different kinds. We like to work with a swarm of little things. We understand that little interventions are much easier to implement. They're better at involving the community in the process. They are uh, low stake uh, uh, and therefore if, if something fails, it doesn't matter. It was a small thing and therefore allow for this iterative process that goes step by step improving things bit by bit. We work on pedestrian crossings, um, which you know, are incredibly important, not just for safety reasons, but really to show clearly to people that spaces were designed for them and not for the vehicles. And we try to do it in funny ways, in, in uh, interesting, non-conventional ways. We work a lot in uh, public furniture. We have a tradition that's also part of the Reber legacy on creating high quality uh, public furniture that is bringing uh, you know, whimsical and um, fun elements to the public space to show that public space is for everybody and for everybody to use. Wayfinding is equally important and always uh, a way to very simply improving the quality of public space. Uh, work on installations that are trying to blur the boundary between art and furniture, again, to bring this idea of dignity and quality to, to the public realm. Working with lighting, as we started in the beginning at, at Reburn, and we continue to do. And working activating public space where public space is, is inactive through what is you know, the ultimate activator, which is food and commerce. Uh, no good public space design can be done without a clear understanding on the relationship between commercial activity and, and the public realm. And of course, we, uh, we continue to work by activating spaces through culture and events. All of these swarms of uh, uh, little interventions are informed by what the result of our research tells us and are a way to inform longer term planning, longer term projects, and longer term improvements in public space. Through this methodology, we have now over three years worked in several American cities, many, many American cities. This is just a, a, a small fraction uh, of smaller cities. And we continue to do a lot of international work. I just want to go very rapidly. I thought this was a good way to um, show you quickly a lot of projects um, through a series of slides that show intervention. We go back to that very humble, little um, activist intervention in San Francisco 10 years ago that is still in many ways, as you will see, um, can be considered a point of start of what came after. We worked uh, in Sao Paulo where our research done by counting people crossing and jaywalking became a way to inform a series of improvements in, um, in key intersections. We worked in Melbourne where we helped transforming the laneways between tall buildings in downtown from um, completely inactive and quite desolate spaces in thriving um, spaces for, for commercial use. We worked in the city of Chongqing in China, um, helping 
the city improving the quality of the pedestrian alleys that were um, defining the space in the older part of the city, we work in a man uh, over this large project reconverting this uh, terrible intersection into a beautiful plaza. We worked in Brighton. Uh, this is one of the early projects that we did in terms of creating a share, shared street. Um, this is not a fully pedestrian street, but it's a street that can operate in different ways, allowing vehicles uh, also to go through. And we worked with the city of Moscow, where we helped, again, the city redefining the space dedicated to cars and the space dedicated to people on the main street. And we worked in Times Square, as I was saying before, helping the city uh, measuring all the flows and all the patterns that were necessary to go from this to that. And transforming Times Square in a place that um, uh, can, out of the blue, uh, become a place just like this. After that our engagement in, uh, in Times Square ended, then uh, Snoeta, uh, the landscape architecture and architecture firm, was in the position to then submit a design for a permanent transformation of uh, Times Square that now has been implemented and it looks roughly like this. We like to think, we, we do think that this project that has transformed Times Square for the generations to come would have not been possible without this coming first. There's no way that you convince everybody and more than everybody, the taxi drivers of New York, um, that a change like this is possible unless you say, okay, we have the data. This is how it looks like. It's gonna be faster and easier for you to move on your car through Manhattan after this project will, will be implemented. But just in case, we are gonna try it only for six months. If it doesn't work, we can, you know, we can go back to what we had before. We are not changing anything in a permanent way. So this way of piloting projects through the assumption that we made uh, thanks to our research is a very good way to navigate the complexity of urban transformation. Urban transformation has a lot of stakeholders, everybody has different opinions, everybody has different interests, and the only way to navigate that complexity is really moving through research first, transform this research in a series of arguments, make the arguments able to inform small interventions which are testing your, your hypothesis, and if your hypothesis was well put and the result is really impactful and a win-win for everybody, then it will be much easier and, and much faster actually to implement ambitious, large, long-term projects. Okay, I wanna finish just uh, showing two tiny little projects I've been working, I've been directing recently just because I, I love them. Uh, and uh, because I think it's a nice note um, on which to finish, I also just didn't want to show only projects that are about uh, improving the, uh, the urban space at the large scale. I want to show something smaller a little bit, um, uh, just uh, interesting for those of you that are interesting in the, in the small scale in particular. This is a project that we just finished in San Francisco. It goes back to the rebar ethos, even if it was done through Gale, of using furniture as a device to really transform the quality of a larger space. This is uh, the Presidio Park, incredible location overlooking uh, the bay and overlooking the bridge. This massive lawn, up until uh, really just a few years ago, was a parking lot. Now, there are some analogies between the Presidio Park of San Francisco and Dix Park here, actually, in, in Raleigh, in the sense that this is a, a beautiful, large park that we have because something very different was happening here. In this case, it was a, it was a military base. And out of the blue, when the, the use is, is, uh, was changed, there's an untapped opportunity to make it the grandest uh, public space in the city. So the parking lot was transformed into a lawn, but because it looks so beautiful and because it's often wet, people were actually not using it at all. 
was always kind of deserted. So the Presidio Trust asked us, can we make something so that people start to use this lawn? Uh, the lawn has a long history. We kind of went back to that for, for inspiration, how it was used in different areas of, of, of its existence. But we tried to, to, to go to that question, so how can we create a real space of, of interaction here? We need to provide comfort, social, uh, so, you know, kind of social uh, interact opportunities for so social interaction, flexibility. There were a, a series of objective and constraints. And we came up with this incredibly simple piece that is really tiny, is a um, chair, we would call it, uh, we, we, we call it the Presidio Love Seat, a chair for two that can be used in many different manners. Uh, and it was supposed to be created for uh, fast production so that we could make many, many of them and with them furnish the entire huge um, space that has the size of three football pitches, uh, yeah, fields. These are little studies of the piece, how, how they can be stacked, how can be arranged. We made a series of prototypes with wood, very, very simple, and then we started production of an actually fairly sophisticated cast iron mold, which then um, allowed us to create, um, to create the piece itself. We fabricated it in LA, we went back um, to the lawn and we deployed it. And this little thing became really a signal for the park and for the city that this was a place for people to stay. And has since then become uh, uh, one of the, I want to say, most, most beloved area, also because it's been activated with many other things, including, in, including food trucks. Um, it's really a delightful experience now to go there um, on a Sunday and enjoy the space and the food. This, the, the last little project, so I'll be equally fast, is um, a project that we cre created for the main square in front of the main station in, in Philadelphia. Again, a desolate space, a parking lot, uh, and not much more than that for a very long time. A place that has a very long-term vision of transformation. But while we're waiting for the funding for this massive project to happen, something else had to happen. The UCD, which is an NGO connected to some of the um, universities of Philadelphia, including Penn, um, already made this incredible job at refurnishing it with very simple, very cheap uh, furniture, some planters, repaving it, and uh, really turned the place around. Um, but they asked us to add something, to add another piece to make it even more whimsical and interesting. They already done a lot of the studies that we usually do, partially inspired by our approach, doing all this count of public life patterns, and because the place was called the porch, uh, we decided to design what we called porch swings. Uh, again, we were working on the idea that a small piece of furniture, if done right, can have a strong impact in the transformation of the place. Again, it was modular. Again, it was reconfigurable. It, it was um, very simple to rearrange in order to test an array of configurations that could, in the long term, inform the definitive design and redesign of the plaza. These little things that you can see can be lifted with a pallet jack, and so just one person can move them around. I'm going to show you some more photos. But the cool thing is that they can be reconfig reconfigured in a series of different manners, providing opportunity for many, many experiments of how that plaza can, can be used. And we also studied the different configuration. This is the entire space of the plaza, and just like little candies, our little units are scattered around. Again, we went back to the prototyping phase. We worked with local fabricators, and we, came, we, we tried to work the ergonomic particularly hard. The idea was that this thing had to be incredibly comfortable has had the dignity of high-end industrial design as you would buy a design by reach, but sturdy as something that you could use for, for years in public space. And these are some photos of the results. As I was saying before, these are movable in the sense they can be lifted and rearranged. There are three different kind of modules, a more relaxed configuration, the kind of classic swing and the classic porch swings. 
And we are incredibly proud of seeing uh, this being used by everybody all the time, um, really transforming what the experiencing of, uh, of waiting for the train is in Philadelphia. People actually now uh, like to stay outside uh, for half an hour or so before their commute in order to really enjoy this space. And uh, in many ways, see many of our principles really becoming uh, visible in a very uh, simple design like this. It's actually very fun to follow our own projects now uh, on Instagram and seeing that people are hashtagging something that you have designed is, uh, is certainly a nice, a nice sensation. Thank you. So buildings are incredible assets uh, if used in the right way. In the case of the Presidio, uh, the Presidio Trust is doing a tremendous job. The Presidio is you know, very vast and also not easily accessible uh, from, from most of, of, this, uh, of the San Francisco. So the city becomes key in bringing activity, in making uh, the place a place that is perceived as, fa as safe also after dark, because they are really bringing energy, uh, they're, they're bringing use, um, helping a park uh, that otherwise would be too big um, and uh, a little bit too isolated from the rest of the city to really function um, in the proper way. So buildings are fundamental, and choosing your adaptive reuse, the new function, is really a critical process and have to be done, take into account all of this um, ramification and all of these potential positive implications. So the streets are, are amenity, just like the parks. And uh, you've given a sense of the little bits of the street, but Hillsborough Street, for example, here in our city, has been described as six streets in one. It's a formal section, an automobile-centric section, a parkway section, a funky town section, and a pastoral section. Mm -hmm. uh, where's your thinking going next on, on the sense of corridor? Yeah, that's a great question. So, well, we insist uh, with, with uh, the cities with which we, we, we work, we insist very much on this idea of streets as places, first of all. This just touches on uh, the issue of corridor. So streets have to be seen not as something that is just about moving things, but also as places where people uh, can linger and enjoy um, uh, living, living the public space. That applies very well to corridor, especially to core corridors. Um, we like to, uh, even if the corridor is changing character, Along, along the way, we like to try to tie everything in uh, through a, a cohesive uh, design that is helping to understand that the entire corridor actually, or most of it can be a place to be and a place to linger. So again, furniture design becomes key, um, and even if uh, the corridor var is, is varying its condition, trying to unify everything with, with some common traits becomes fundamental. Yes? First of all, thank you for the nice history lesson on how it's been evolving in terms of the public space. The question that I have is that it seems like Gail and Rebar are really good at initiating yeah. the first activities to develop the space. But one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in is how do you create longevity? Uh, any cultures evolve in new spaces, the spaces themselves evolve. So how is it that you're dealing with evolution for the space in the future? Or yes. Do you take that into consideration? Yes, this is a, thank you for the question. This is a great question. Well, for us, longevity um, really uh, is uh, more achievable through temporary intervention, which might, might sound counterintuitive, than, than through permanent intervention. We uh, experienced that uh, Traditional designs that were trying to change a place for a very long um, 
span of time, we're often failing in understanding that that place would evolve over time. And so maybe their design, the design that would actually take several years to realize when it was implemented was just functioning for a brief time or maybe by the time it was implemented, the conditions were already changed. So for us, going to this temporary urbanism, if you will, has been our way to say, let's try to be more nimble. Let's, let's, let's solve the problem that we have now. Let's see how the space is evolving. And when the, the space will change, we will be already ready for a new small investment. So through this iterative process, we can always and constantly catching up, catch up with um, with the evolution of the place. So for us, this is a much more resilient way to work that allows much better for, for longevity. Another interesting thing on this is that no matter how much you do your research well, people end up using the space that you design in a way that is different from what you had anticipated. We've seen it uh, several times. I remember my first project in San Francisco was a, was a plaza, was a temporary plaza for the America's Cup. And we really thought of everything as um, a, a great place to sit and look at the water. It was next to the Exploratorium Museum of San Francisco. I remember perfectly the moment in which we you know, took the fence away from the site because it was ready to go. Swarms of kids coming out of the museum started to use all the furniture that we had designed thinking they were, that they were pieces, equipment for a playground. From day one, that became more a playground and less than a plaza. And actually, you know, parents just loved it because they could look at the water. So we thought we were designing a plaza, but actually we had designed something that was even more successful as a playground. Then at that point, it was clear that the place had told us what the place wanted to be. And because the project was a temporary project, was a low stake, you know, uh, uh, very simple implementation, uh, it was no problem. We could then design a new phase with a little bit more of investment, uh, knowing what the real identity of that place is wanted to be and designing for that. Any other questions? Yes, here in the front. Yeah, I Downtown, we have lots of people with animals. Okay. I'm curious if you have addressed how animals are accommodated pets or accommodated pets in the urban space. Because you've made exactly the same face that other planners do. Have less of I don't know what that face is. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I guess my, my facial expression was wow, working so hard trying to understand how to design for people and now. Uh, now there is yet another untapped uh, territory. Uh, mm, well, you know, uh, I guess that um, I like to think that our methodology is uh, actually uh, fairly prepared to um, accommodate whatever needs are in, in place, right? Because we start from direct observation. And in more than one project, actually, um, you know, designing for animals became a thing because starting from observation, we could see that some of the fundamental life patterns of that place were related to the relationship between people and their pets. And so we were able to fold that in uh, pretty easily. I don't have a, a very direct answer to your question, but I can tell you that if you start with humble observation of a space, you usually get pretty close to what that split space is, is calling you for. If it, that space is influenced by the strong presence of uh, animals, then um, direct observation will help you identify that and then uh, put in the best position to design for that. Yes? Um, this is to piggyback on two questions Closer. ago. This is to pick back on two questions ago about um, the activity. I'm curious, do you ever work with entities or organizations that help program the place? So a place that may not be used, um, just putting stuff out there may not be enough, you know, do, do you ever yeah. coordinate with Yeah, but putting stuff out is rarely enough. And then it's funny because uh, our, our practice is split between these two words physically, like, our projects in, in the US, in Canada, and our projects you know, uh, in Latin America, where cities are actually facing opposite problems. 
sorry. Uh, in Latin America, there's not a problem with activating spaces. Like every space in the city is really exploding with, with life. And instead, the quality of the public space is actually quite terrible in many cases. So our job is never activating. Our job is always support the activity that already exists with better, um, with better designs and better infrastructure. In many cities in the US, if not most of the cities in the US, we have exactly the same, uh, I'm sorry, exactly the opposite problem. We have a lack of public life uh, that it comes from many, many uh, decades of um, a progressive uh, uh, transformation of our cities. The environments are often not in the condition to, to, to provide invitations for their public life. And then there are other cultural factors. It's a very complicated manner, but our main job in many cities is activating spaces. Um, in many cities more, in some cities more, in some cities less. We've done the counting exercise recently in Akron, Ohio, and there was nothing to count because you know, there was just no people in the streets. Um, so absolutely, activation through events becomes a key part of our work. We are not specialists in, uh, in event planning or anything like that, but we can provide the data uh, as a baseline, show how a street is working uh, when that activity was, was not in place, and then use that information to help whoever is planning to plan better. Um, we can help uh, the planning of the events, the creation of events by helping whoever is planning it by uh, be able to better listen what the community wants and then to help them evaluate the impact of that. Actually, uh, in many, many cases, that's where, really where you want to start. Um, events are cheaper than uh, a real urban design projects and, they, uh, and you can learn so much from it. Uh, it's also about changing the minds of people, showing that a place that there was a derelict uh, space can actually be the place where something fantastic happens once a week. And that's, that's the first step to turn that place around. Hi. Uh, so I'm really interested in uh, mass transportation and applying these principles of. Um, I'm sorry, I lost. I lost oh, yeah, sure. I'm really interested in mass transportation. Mass transportation. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, Raleigh is um, transforming its uh, bus system, which will bring more people, hopefully, into the city that's already coming. Um, so, since we're such an auto centric country, um, using is it, have you ever been approached by that industry to bolster the like um, the bus stops as a visibility? Um, yeah. Just to educate or, or bring attention to that as a possible choice for movement. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, I actually would have wanted to talk a little bit more about transportation um, and mobility, but I couldn't show everything. But so this question helps you touch on that. We do a lot of work um, on mobility, on sustainable mobility, and even more on the intersection between sustainable mobility and the quality of the public realm. We are not um, transportation experts per se, but we work always with uh, transportation experts to um, better uh, define the principles behind their, their, their planning and how that connects with the quality of public space. Well, there, you know, it's, it's, such a, it's, a, it's such a large topic, but to put it very simply, everywhere, including in the US, uh, when we talk about mobility to, um, to whoever wants to start to look at uh, sustainable mobility, we say that it is a three-legged stool. And you need each of the three legs to really make a good sustainable mobility system. You need to work on pedestrian infrastructure, that's fundamental, and improve walkability of environments, um, improving the, you know, the permeability of, 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 of urban space. You need to work on bicycle infrastructure that is actually growing incredibly in many American urban, uh, urban areas, and you need to work on uh, public transit, mass transit. If you work on these three things 
at the same time is where great things start to happen. You should not devote yourself just to one of these three fields. And these three things works, works very well together. But then the most critical and most difficult, most challenging part of, of all of this is that the bones of American cities in many cases um, are designed with a scale and with a series of distances and the relationship between the buildings and, and the street is such that it's really hard to make an environment that is not walkable, walkable again. So uh, there are solutions, but you have to start with this awareness that you have this added complexity that is, that is given by, by, by scales. So in these three years, we're really developing a vocabulary of solutions to work in this very specific context where the scale is very big and everything needs what we call a road diet. Uh, that is like shrinking a little bit, reducing distances, making facades more permeable um, in order to make the environment an environment where you really you can get around easily by walking, biking, and taking public transit. Then the last thing I want to say is that, um, in, you know, I mean, I, I'm actually the only non-American in, in my practice in San Francisco. So I think, I think it would be wrong to try to bring an European model in the US. Um, so when we work on mobility, we have to do it understanding, uh, understanding how American cities work and really finding solutions that work well here. Uh, often we, 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 we find out that uh, some people think that the solution is bringing European or Asian mobility solution to the US, I think is a little bit more complicated than that. Nevertheless, our env environments have to become more walkable, more bikeable. Uh, that's, th that's the way to public health, that's the way to resilience, that's the way to the future, and there's no doubt about that.